I'm going to do two more type of modeling. What type of modeling was done during those presentations? Hmm. Well, Lisa would um, say the question and the answer and then have them repeat it. Yeah, um, very good. Before she even made them, like, create it themselves. Okay, yeah, very good. So, any other types of modeling? I don't think of any other types of modeling that was done during the presentation. There was a, there was a gesture that went with uh, the phrase, and that was sort of uh, encouraged for the students who were doing the repeating. Oh, okay. Yeah, definitely. Yeah? Um, Lulu, Lulu used herself as an example of saying, I'm from New York. Oh, okay. Yeah. Could some brave soul come up and help me and model, just tonight, watching the clock, one of the modeling techniques is think aloud. Could someone come here and model if they've never seen this word before? How would they, how would they think aloud and model it for students? Because a lot of us in the Connect book, the students are starting to read, and they're starting to come across words they've never seen before. Anyone, would anyone dare me? I, I, I can do that. Yeah, can I use the words? Yeah, of course. This is what old-fashioned syllables used in the States, right? Tis. Tis. This works with many age groups. Sta. 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 Tis. Tis. Ticks. Ticks. And we can play around with that. And then statistics. It's put together. Statistics. Statistics. So I think this is really useful. Uh, if with you know for many age groups, I do this all the time, and some of my adult students say, mm, "Oh, yeah, I thought about breaking that apart." So. Okay, good. Thank you. That's exactly what. Yeah, sorry, so, good. Good. Okay. so again, you have to come back to the idea again. Like sometimes when I'm in the Connect book and students are reading the book and then they get to a word, like how much frustration do you want to let them have? Right? Like in my, maybe my frustration level is different. They're probably a lot more patient than I am. So when we come to those kind of words, is to at least model for them how, you know, how would you sound out of perhaps a word that they're finding difficult and being patient enough and taking enough time to realize they're not going to say it like a, a Canadian or American or British or Australian or whoever else is in the room, just to be inclusive. Not to say it in a way that's not, uh, you know, the exact way we would. Okay. Can anyone come up? And talk aloud solving a math problem if you were to model. Not that they're going to be solving math problems, but they say there's like a process they have to go through. Anyone brave enough to do it? It's the last thing you have to do when we're done. Does anyone dare? Ricardo, thank you! <laughs> <laughs> Just, you know, small minds. Take what can. <laughs> yeah. Just, but think aloud as you're doing it. Well, when I was. Trying to talk aloud, I use gestures because that helps me play a lot, especially with math. <laughs> so, I guess the problem is 12 minus 4. Sure. So, yeah. okay. so, I guess, you know, you could substitute minus or take away. So 12 take away 4. So, 1, 2, 3, 4. <laughs> yeah, no. So, I, then, if, if you were to write it on the board, how would you do it? In okay. your mind. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just like that one. <laughs> just, just. So, I guess an easier way to do it is to maybe like make little hash marks, <laughs> and then so you know four, so twelve minus four, so one, two, three, four. And then you can count the answer. Eight. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah it's just that, that you're saying it out loud for the student to actually see what your actual process is that you're going through. And it's just another way of giving an example of modeling, and then over a period of time, you start to fade that away, and they would obviously start to own the process and be able to do it themselves. Very last point I want to make, and again, it's one of the things that I struggle with too, is generally, you don't want to help the students with anything they can do. You ever, you know, sometimes in class, you know, there's a rush or there's time, and so you're sitting there and you're starting to offer them information, give them information for things that you know they can do on their own. So we don't want to be helping students with things they can do on their own because it only takes away from their independent learning ability. So if they can do it by themselves, 
you know, give them the time to do it, and there's no need to rush through because it'll be a lot more powerful for them. I uh, put up here one thing about frustration. I think it's easy for us to see students who are frustrated when it's too hard, but I don't think it's easy for me to see at least students who are frustrated when it's too easy. Right? I think it's very easy to notice like when students are having a hard and hard time, you see the anger and anxiety. It's a little bit more difficult when I watch students and you see that what they're doing is too easy. And they're getting frustrated as well that they're having to sit for 10 minutes to do something that only took them a minute and it's taking everyone else 10 minutes. So it's something to, to, to watch for. Last point was to help them, you know, motivate them, to pull them in. It's always best to start with something everyone in the class can do. And to be sensitive enough to know that you're going to start with something that, you know, sends a pattern or structure everyone in the class can do. After they do that, then move on to something that's a little more difficult. I want to thank you guys. You've been great. You've participated so much. Thank you.